Hello, good afternoon everyone. I'm Jennifer from uh, Oral, I represent our Oral Cancer Research and Coordinating Centre, which is located in the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Malaya. Now, how many of you have heard of mouth cancer? Yeah, that's, that's very encouraging because um, in our country, from our surveys, you'd be surprised that many people don't even know there's such a thing as mouth cancer. And, um, and especially those who are actually more susceptible because of risk habits, such as the indigenous people in Sabah and Sarawak. They, when you talk about mouth cancer, they are oblivious to it. Yeah? So today I'd like to share a little bit of how our support group, which is a very small support group, and um, how, what we do for our, our patients. Now, allow me first to orientate, orientate you with some facts about oral cancer patients. Now, firstly, as even the pink unity mentioned, oral cancer patients are mostly from B40 background. And what is unique about oral cancer is it lacks visibility in our country, okay? Which is sad because uh, sufferers of oral cancer, they experience very high levels of debility. Now, why do you think that's so? That's because our mouth occupies a very central position in our face. You can imagine, yeah? We use our mouth for chewing, our teeth for chewing, for swallowing, for aesthetics, for smiling, for our self-image. So when a person, you can imagine, when a person gets oral cancer, more often than not, many structures around the mouth are affected. And this would include a lot of surgery, right? Surgical intervention, there'll be scarring. Yeah, you'd have to remove part of your tongue, part of the bones, and it'll definitely affect all of these very, very important daily functions. Okay? So therefore, do oral cancer patients face impacts? Yes, certainly. So we decided to identify gaps for support care. What exactly do they need? <clears throat> now, some of our previous studies that we did indicated that these are some of the needs, the 10 top needs of oral cancer patients and survivors. If you can see these in the boxes, I are actually categorized as psychological needs. So their psychosocial needs are very, very high. They are amounting to second and third in importance. So as such, in recognition of this, we decided that they need some sort of support group to help with their psychosocial needs. Now, as I said, our oral cancer patients, uh, they are treated at our faculty as one of the uh, centers treating mouth cancer. And they are, when they come to us, they're mostly debilitated. That's because our studies have shown that two thirds of our patients only appear at clinics when they are at advanced stage. So inevitably, they, you'll, see, you'll see them at third and fourth stage. Okay? Now, in such a debilitated stage, they are not, not uh, in any form, uh, uh, they are not really very, uh, what shall I say? Can't seem to find the word. Uh, they're not very agreeable. They're not very agreeable to go to some other place for support. So therefore, we said, no, we'll start. We'll start this. So in 2017, we initiated this effort in the Faculty of Dentistry under OCRCC. And our objective for support care was to provide holistic supportive care and wellness activities for our patients, no matter how small a group they are. So here, I'm going to show you some photos of how we initiated it. It was in uh, 29 November 2017, uh, we had our University of Malaya Pro Chancellor coming in to officiate the whole um, patient support care. And here you have photos with our patients. 
Yeah, so this was the launching ceremony. And here, just to give you an idea of what happens during our peer support group. Now, just now, I think Pink Unity has mentioned that I think they nicely <coughs> categorize what they do during support group, giving emotional support and also sometimes <coughs> just sharing and being there as a listening ear to a fellow peers who are cancer survivors. Okay. <clears throat> so these are some of our sessions where we've had an oral cancer survivor actually facilitating the group. Yeah? And we have this somewhat once or twice a month. Besides that, since we started this in 2017, we had involvement of other NGOs come in and also contribute to activities, as you can see here. NCSM also came in to, to show them how to do art therapy for stress. And we had our oral health industry come in to share with them about oral health care, as well as even Mary Kay coming in to teach them the basics about self-grooming, which they need once they undergo uh, surgery yeah? and with scarring. Then we've also, in collaboration with our sports science at University of Malaya, they've come in to do exercises with them. For example, here it's upper limb exercises, because many of them do have extensive surgery involving lymph nodes and causing limitation in shoulder movement. Yeah? And we've also had our doctorate in public health students come in and share about how oral health education and we've put it into their curriculum, the, our students' curriculum, so that they can come and be there for our patients. Now, during MCO, it was not possible to meet physically, so we actually facilitated an online sharing, off and on, at least once a month, whereby all our patients and survivors would get together and share and encourage each other. So it was really good to see that happening when we couldn't meet face to face. And besides our normal weekly peer sharing groups, uh, every year in conjunction with World Cancer Day, we would, we would conduct a survival skills workshop for our patients, a half day workshop where, where they would come and uh, we would invite speakers, for example, dietitians from PPUM or psychiatrists to come and talk about the issue of stress, how to cope with stress. And every year we had a different theme. Yeah? This was in 2020 and they get, we give them certificates in acknowledgement of their time to come. This was in 2021. Okay, we had our own surgeon come in also to talk because the, the topic of the talks is based on the needs of the patients. Normally before uh, the beginning of the year, we'll ask them, what is it you all want to know more? And based on that, we cater to their needs. And then we have some exercises for them as well, which they thoroughly like. So what did they think about this whole program, the patient support? These are some of their verbatim, yeah? As you can see, they are very positive, very positive. It was helpful, beneficial to, to prepare them for what is to come post-surgery. That's where the impacts are very, very high. And just knowing that somebody else has the same condition and how they are coping well is so reassuring for our patients, for the new ones who come. Now, some time ago, probably in 2018, we received a grant from University of Malaya to actually move further to come up with a personalized support care beyond the boundaries of the clinic using mobile apps. Yeah? So this was our grant that we received. And we then tested these mobile apps, which we call Max, and we had circulated among our patients. And they do use it. Although some of them are very, they're not very IT savvy or, you know, handphone savvy, but however, they still manage to use it. 
Now, besides peer support programs, we've, we have found that one of the gaps is creating awareness among Malaysian society about the needs and the impacts and the journey struggles of oral cancer patients. So since 20, 2005, we have had, OCRCC has always uh, pioneered the, the uh, Mouth Cancer Awareness Week, and it was normally in November, right till last year. This year, we are doing it in conjunction with the month of February to be in tandem with World Cancer Day. So this is one way we try to uh, create awareness about, about mouth cancer and also about the plight of uh, mouth cancer survivors. So during 2021 launching of our mouth cancer awareness, which was indoors and it was officiated by our health minister then, we actually showcased uh, online sharing of our survivors, which was very, very uh, impactful to the audience and then this just this year in, we just had this launched again our mouth cancer at dataran dbkl free car free morning we normally do it now in uh, dbkl during car free morning to create public more public awareness and we have a lot of activities going on and we have the meet and greet session here for where our cancer survivors have an opportunity to interact with the public and for the public to interact with them to, to understand the journey they go through. Yeah, so this was their sharing session this year, just February 4th. And also, I think in 2021, to create public awareness, we did write an article about our, our patient uh, support care and the use of the mobile apps at our faculty for our oral cancer patients in the NST. So these are just some of the, the gaps that we have identified in some of the strategies that we have implemented to close these gaps. But we would like to actually um, appeal to all the other patient support care groups that if there's an opportunity for us to collaborate with you all, we would be very, very happy. So with that, thank you. Are there any questions? What is the youngest age uh, for your patient? I mean, your, okay. your experience? Previously, there was a very, uh, very, uh, let's say, a pattern where it was always the older age groups, 50 and above. But however, of late, in the last two, three years, we are seeing a slow change in pattern where we see younger patients in the 20s also having it without any practice of risk habits. So this is very unusual because we know oral cancer is always related to high risk habit practice, smoking, beetle, could quit chewing and certain other aspects. But here we are seeing a slight change in, in, uh, in pattern. So we're seeing younger people getting it now as well, and no practice of risk habits. Yeah. Okay. Is there any relation between vape and mouth cancer? Bit vape. 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 Because okay. they just came in Malaysia in the last two, three years. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting question, actually. Uh, we don't, as far as I know, there's no uh, correlation how, with vape and mouth cancer. However, we've done some studies which show that vape is just as, well, let's say bad as smoking in causing changes to our, our mucosa in the mouth. So I think that's what we have evidence for. But I do not think there's any evidence as yet. So since there's evidence, to, early evidence to show that it's it can cause changes in the mucosa of the mouth, I think we need to be very careful about vaping. Yeah? Any other questions? Thank you very much.